Hello everyone and welcome. And I hope everyone's having an amazing new year. And what a new year it's been so far. We've had beautiful blue skies, starry nights, waves. I've just had the news through after listening to Boris Johnson's speech about all the restrictions being lifted. And I just want to say like how amazing it is how that everyone, you know, all these people who's kind of stuck true to their beliefs and knowing that, you know, in the end, if we work together, that actually we can create change. Um, so my name's Sarah Louisa and I work here at Nuki Therapy Centre. I work as a therapist. Um, I use a lot of different modalities, hypnotherapy, EFT, NLP, and I basically work with a subconscious mind. And I work with finding traumas, finding limiting beliefs, and also just like finding those negative energies which are inside us all and just shifting them. So basically I call myself a demon hunter because I kind of find those things that are keeping you stuck in your life. And here at the therapy center, there's uh, me, Donna, Ange, Phil, and Ola, and we're just working to create a really, really beautiful space. We offer a whole range of different things, um, whole, loads of different therapies like the hypnotherapy, the NLP, we do training courses, we offer counseling, we're getting into workshops and starting to do a lot of ceremonies. I'm doing a lot of cacao ceremonies and that's like my favorite at the moment, I'm just loving it. So yeah, just trying to get this real sort of community vibe going on. And talking about community, what a community we live in. Like Nuki is such an amazing place and such an amazing thing to be part of. I've lived here for pretty much last 20 years. And yeah, it's just, everybody here just seems to be so open and everyone's looking out for each other. It's really cool. And you know, with Whiskers just doing this wonderful platform, this wellness platform, I just want to say, guys, thank you very, very much for inviting me to do this talk for you. And just, you know, knowing that people are out there and they're looking after our mental health. And a mental health has been a massive, massive thing over the last couple of years for everyone, you know? You know, me doing my job, all the people that are coming through, I have people from the ages of literally 14 to 70 who are coming to see me with all different problems a lot of it is anxiety and depression and it's kind of come to the surface from all the situations that have happened to us over the last couple of years and you know all these lockdowns all these restrictions have been very very hard for us and people have dealt with it very very differently and because we've been stripped bare of all our distractions, all of the things that we used to do that were fun, going to pubs, going to cinemas, going to clubs, hanging out with your friends, hanging out with your family, it's all been taken away from us. And we kind of just had to sit down with ourselves with no distraction and see kind of what's really, really going on. And at that point when we sit with ourselves, that's where things come to the surface and we have to deal with them. But we have to have the resources to be able to deal with them, to kind of shift and kind of heal. And my talk today is going to be about one of the big distractions that we have. And that is our old friend, or maybe not so much of a good friend, alcohol. <laughs> so if you stay with me till the end, what we're going to be talking about is exactly why we drink the root causes of the drinking and how we can find those root causes and how we can heal. But before we do so, I'm going to invite you, I wanna just do a little exercise with you guys called heart coherence. Now, heart coherence is when we kind of just drop back into our hearts. We spend so much time buzzing around and in our heads and being kind of like, led by our egos and when we are in our heads you know our minds if they're not mastered they can completely completely torture us so actually our heart is our main guidance system okay so heart coherence or this exercise that i'm going to teach you was developed by um, heart math some years ago and it is basically just dropping back into that heart and just regulating ourselves. Because what happens is a lot of the time, a lot of the time when we're triggered, a lot of the time when we're in fight or flight, we end up being in this state of stress where 
um, a lot of cortisol and a lot of adrenaline is running around our bodies. So we just want to, when we are triggered, just go back to that state of peace. And peace, of course, is the natural state of being. So this particular uh, meditation or technique is used a lot by um, the services like the police, the fire, fire brigade and all those, because they are often like in these really, really stressful situations. They need to come back down to that plateau that calm as quickly as possible. So what I am going to invite you to do, this um, this exercise is probably going to take us about four minutes. So if you can, I'd love it if you could just give me your full attention, turn off your phone, turn off your distractions. I'm just going to give you like a minute to do that, all right? Hey guys. So what I'm going to invite you to do now is to just close your eyes, okay? And close your eyes and I want you to place your hands upon your heart. All right. So we're just going to place our hands upon our heart and we're just going to start to breathe. So we're going to take in nice, big, deep cleansing breaths. And then just letting go of that breath. And once more, breathing in. And just letting go of your day so far. And again, big, deep breaths. And just letting go of anything that's happened so far today. And another one. Just imagine bringing it, breathing in light, breathing in love, breathing in peace. Just letting go of anything that does not serve you. And the next breath that we're going to take, we're going to just begin to take it into the heart. And as we take that breath into the heart, we're just going to feel that sacred, beautiful space just starting to activate. Just feeling yourself really connecting into that heart. Just breathing deeply into your heart, knowing that the more that you relax, the better you feel. And the better you feel, the more that you relax and tune into that sacred heart space. And what I'm going to ask you to do now is to bring to mind something or someone or some place that you really, really love. And as you do so, I want you to just really tune into that feeling Feel into that beautiful, elevated, positive emotion. Feeling into that energy. And as you do, I want you just to imagine that energy, that positive, beautiful feeling to start to spread through your heart. And it spreads through the chambers of your heart, the cells, the tissues, and it begins to just radiate out from the heart all the way up to the shoulders, down the torso, down the spine, vertebrae by vertebrae, down into those legs, all the way down to the feet, getting into every single cell within your body. And then allowing that beautiful feeling now from your torso to just cascade down your arms and into your fingers and then up your neck into your head you let that beautiful feeling swirl around your brain the left hemisphere and the right until you feel that wonderful positive emotion in every single 60 trillion cells within your body and you feel those cells just being activated and you feel them as they begin to dance and vibrate and just gently begin to radiate out of your body and just let that energy just radiate out of your body and keep growing and growing and growing until it's wrapped around you, three foot all around you, three foot up in the air, 360 degrees and it's creating 
a protection bubble, an energetic protection bubble all around you. And I want you now to just put your intention into this bubble that nothing that is of not for your highest good may enter this bubble. And let anything that is of any lower vibration than love will just simply bounce off. So just take another big deep breath now and just embody this wonderful energy throughout every single cell of your body and this protective bubble. And so it is, and so it is, and so it is. And when you're ready, guys, you can just open your eyes. Thank you. I was drawn really by my own experiences to create a program called Freedom from Alcohol. So I'll tell you my own little sad story now. Basically, alcohol and drugs, but mainly alcohol, controlled my life for pretty much 20 years. And I grew up in Birmingham, so, <laughs> very very different from growing up here we were kind of in the suburbs and it was in the 90s which again was a very very different time to what it is now and you know i got into drinking and drugs taking when i was very very young and at that time and in that place it was kind of just what you did it was kind of this rites of passage you know we'd start smoking and drinking and drug taking and so yeah, from a really quite an early age, I was taking acid and I was taking ease. And yeah, I used to drink, but drink really for me was never, it was never my driving force. It was something that I would do if I couldn't take drugs. <laughs> because, you know, even then, and even being a young, a young sort of teenager, I realised that, and back in those days, the ease were really good. And I'd take them and I would have this experience of where I felt this unity with everybody around me, with the world. I felt this great compassion and this great love. You know, I'd take acid or mushrooms and again, I'd feel connected, right? And feeling connected is basically, it's our natural state of being. Feeling compassion, feeling love, feeling unity are a natural state of being. Drinking alcohol never made me feel those things. and really it should have been a massive red flag for me at that time because I always used to act like a complete dick when I was pissed <laughs> so but I, I carried on anyway and as I got into my later teens all the ease and the drugs started to become they just stopped being very good and I got more and more into drinking you know throughout my teens and my 20s it was I lived in Newquay I went traveling all the time and it was kind of like an endless summer and, you know, everywhere that I was was party towns. And that's what we did. We just partied and went surfing and it was fun. And I did used to get hideous hangovers, but I just used to power through. It was, I was having a good time, so it was okay. But when I got into my 30s, my drinking began to become really, really detrimental. I was the girl who would literally drink until I passed out or there was no more alcohol left because I literally had no on-off switch. And this became really, really bad because most of the time when I drank, I suffered from really, really bad blackouts. And what I actually didn't realize at that time, and I've only literally probably found it in the last year, is that what happens to our bodies when we actually black out is, if you imagine alcohol, if you imagine like an essential oil or something, right? And you, you would use alcohol to put into that oil to extract the essence or the soul out of it, right? Because it cannot, that soul, that essence cannot live within that when that alcohol is added. And that is exactly the same as what happens to our bodies. So if our bodies are so intoxicated with drugs or with alcohol, what tends to happen is our soul literally leaves the building or our soul will leave our body. And when it does that, we are kind of left with this like empty vessel. Now, 
around us are all kind of like entities or lower entities, right? And when you have an like a low vibrational body or vessel, right, they can just hop into that and basically take it for a, a, a joyride, so to speak. This may resonate with any of you who this has ever happened to. You've blacked out and you've done things that are completely out of character. Or to anyone who's seen your partner or your best friends just like literally in that state where it's like the lights are on but no one's home and they're acting completely, completely out of character. And you say, what the fuck's got into you? Who are you? I don't even know you, right? This is exactly what's happened to that person. Now... Because this used to happen to me all the time, I would wake up in the morning and the first thing that I would think was like, what the fuck happened last night? And I literally couldn't most nights remember how I got home, who I talked to, who I'd upset, where my keys were, where my phone was, any anything. So I'd just be in this state of anxiety. And it was hideous, just this fear, this literal fear to go out of my house and to like face the day. And so for me, just getting through that day was really, really, really difficult. And my brain as well, because it got so much like poison within it, my brain was completely, completely coherent. So doing like something really simple, like I used to live in the center of town, um, and Londis, for example, was one minute away from my house. And if I had to go and buy fags, sometimes it would take me like four hours to be able to get out of the house because I'd be so scared of actually having to be at the counter and pay for them or scared of who I was going to see or who I'd bump into or who like who I'd upset or like whatever. It would just cause so much crippling, crippling anxiety for me. So literally getting through the day, if I had to go to work, I'd, I also got to a point where I created this this character or this front so people did not know that I was feeling this way right and I I was getting through and I was smiling and everything but deep deep inside I just was an absolute absolute wreck and then by the kind of like the end of the day which you know I at that time during my 30s I was working as a self instructor so we used to finish early like two, two one two three and we just go straight to the pub. I, I, I worked in Belushi's anyway, so it's just as soon as you finish, have a pint. Now, I'd have one pint and it would start to take the edge off. I'd have two pints, three pints, four pints. And at that point, I start to feel like a normal human being again, right? I was back in my flow. I was laughing, I was having fun. And that anxiety had gone. The coherence had come back into me or I didn't actually give a fuck anymore. I was just rolling with it. But cool if I'd have stopped there it might have been okay but I didn't what I used to do every single time was I drink 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 and such is addiction I'd keep going keep going keep going keep going till I passed out or there's no more alcohol left and then that cycle would start again and I stayed in that cycle for absolutely years and nobody knew that I felt that way because I didn't tell them and also like I thought drink was my friend I actually believe that like any situation that I'd been in, like drink had always been there for me. And I defended, like I defended alcohol so much, even though I literally fucked up so many things, so many relationships, so many friendships, so many jobs, so much opportunities, so many trips that I was on, all because of alcohol. And I injured myself. And that's just like, that's the broken path that it leads behind, leaves behind us. And because ultimately alcohol is a poison and if you, it's okay if you drink it in that moderation, but we don't, okay? So the only thing that literally stopped me in the end and got me off this crazy train, this crazy road of which I was pretty much going to self-destruction um, was when I was 35, I became pregnant with my beautiful little boy, Bo. This is like nearly seven years ago. And... Luckily for me, something in within my brain, within my mind, kicked in and was like, you know, I will not drink, I will not smoke, I will not, you know, take drugs while I have this beautiful baby grown within me. So spontaneously, I just stopped it all. And I presumed that as soon as I stopped these behaviours and these, you know, these, these patterns that I was in, that actually all that anxiety would go. 
and all that fear would go. But guess what? It didn't. <laughs> what I didn't actually realise at that time was that all of my debauched behaviour and all of my drinking and escapism was actually covering like a really deep wound that was inside me and that I was basically self-soothing. So the, the, next, the next chapter basically was me knowing that there was something wrong and trying to figure out a way to heal that. And I did. <laughs> and that's pretty much why I'm here today, because I'm here to show you and explain to you where these wounds come from, where these behaviours come from and how we can um, how we can heal them. So my main question and what I always used to wonder in this life was why are there some friends of mine or some people who are quite happy to go out moderately have three or four pints be quite happy go home maybe have a slight little hangover the next day but remember everything that happened and just you know be quite happy to roll on there was the other people who would like i say drink the bar dry get absolutely fucked up and just a quick note here of just saying that i never had really many of those friends who were moderate <laughs> we, we were all just records but that goes back to this whole thing about law of attraction and like attracting like you know that that thing birds of a feather flock together and it's like you know my vibration was that of like a big drinker and a big record so i could go anywhere in the world and not know a soul and walk into you know any place and i would attract those people to me and i always did so whenever i was trying to kind of get away from things I would just attract the same thing to me again and again and again because that was my vibration, that's who I was. Now, I, do, I just don't, people who are in that vibration just stay away from me because I, I'm repelling to them. <laughs> Probably quite dis disgusting now, I'm not a big drinker. But, um, so what I did is I went through a lot of healing for myself, um, life coaching, and then I kind of just started training in in these modalities myself so like i said i started with my eft and my matrix room printing and i went on to hypnotherapy and nlp and the thing which was really really apparent to me is about this wound that is made in children in the programming years now you may or may not have heard of the programming years and what it's about is it's this age group of zero to seven I'm just going to say that I'm going to leave a little link below this video of Bruce Lipton describing this a lot better than I am. <laughs> so I am going to explain it to you. But yeah, that is a little resource for you if you want to watch it. But so yeah, programming years is zero to seven. So if you imagine we're born into this world, you know, all babies, they're born and they're a blank slate. All they are is this like ball of beautiful, unconditional love, right? They are literally just attached to everything and everyone. They don't know that they are separate. They're just this ball of unity and love. And when babies are born, up until that point of zero to two, they're basically in a state of delta. And the brainwave state of delta is the, the, the state that, as us adults, would call completely asleep, like fast asleep. So they're kind of like fast asleep. So when we reach the age of two we move into the brainwave of theta from two until seven. Now, theta brainwave is kind of what you'd be in in a sort of meditational state, but also um, it's what our brain slips into when we're kind of watching TV, right? Just in that suggestible state. And this is when the brain gets programmed. Hence, television programs being called programs because we're being programmed we're in this suggestible state um within this suggestible state in this theta state for these young kids what happens is is these beautiful little brains are just like these little sponges okay and all of the information that goes into them is taken as gospel because they have no analytical mind 
right? Absolutely no analytical mind. And they're being programmed. They're being programmed by their parents, by their teachers, um, and also they're being programmed which is very interesting, not necessarily by things that have been said by people, but also watching, watching what's going on. So a lot of things are learned behavior, okay? So you don't have to tell a child something for it to become into their psyche and then think that that's how they do it. For example, the way that you love a child, okay? If you love a child, you really love a child, that's how they think that they should show love. A lot of people don't even know how to love because it's never been shown to them. They've never learned that. Um, so with that being said, those seven years of life are when those programs, the programs for life are being installed into that computer. And if, those first seven years of life are great and they feel safe and they feel nurtured and they feel loved. And that's exactly how they will feel for the rest of their life. They will feel happy in the, happy in the world. They will feel abundant. They will feel safe. They will feel loving. But on the other hand, if that is not what happens to them, then they're going to feel the opposite. And when we go to talking about childhood trauma, now trauma for a child is very, very, very different to what trauma for an adult is. Okay, so trauma for us is, you know, getting robbed, getting raped, whatever. For a child, imagine a one-year-old or a two-year-old, something traumatic is when someone shouts at them, when someone scares them, when someone's not there for them, when they feel alone, okay? Like, you can, a, a, a trauma or trauma capsule can be made for a little kid who's constantly told, you're not a very good boy, you're not a very nice, a nice girl, you know, or not being picked up on school on time, you know, even 10 minutes late, that puts this fear into these kids that can last a lifetime with them. So going back to that thing of like, if all of your needs are not met, and many of us have situations, you know, where our parents split up or, you know, mom's got postnatal um, depression, many, many different things that you, you wouldn't necessarily would think would create this wound, but it does. It creates this wound within this child. And the child can't heal that wound by themselves. And I briefly wanted to tell you about my own personal wound. And I didn't, I literally only realized this maybe two years ago. I thought in my head, so, you know, people who are big drinkers or whatever, I thought about myself, maybe it's genetic, maybe it's environmental, maybe it's because I started drinking and drug taking when I was young that I damaged my brain. You know, maybe that's why I haven't got an on off switch. But what I realized was, is that my, you know, I was covering up this wound and that's what we try to do. We try and protect this wound and mine happened. So I had quite a lovely childhood. My parents were lovely and they loved me. I mean, my mum, she was a nursery teacher, so she knew all about the programming years. She knew how to like really build you up and she always told me that I was amazing and beautiful and all those things, which is which there is my core belief in life. But what happened was my mum was very, very poorly when I was a little girl. And so she used to spend quite a lot of time in hospital. And... Um, I remember as a child this this feeling within myself this like deep deep sadness this deep longing this disconnection of desperately wanting to be with my mum and from a little girl of being like four I made this belief system because my brother was only two bless him and I made this decision that I had to be the strong one that I had to be you know, I couldn't show my emotions. I always had to be there for him. So he was kind of able to cry and I wasn't. And that was something that I carried through life with me until I kind of healed it, to not be this emotional being, to always be like shuttered and strong. 
And my point is, is that that was that was my my wound, my emotional wound. And also to say in this, you know, in in this talk that what happened at that point, that's nobody's fault. I'm not blaming my my mom or my parents. That was just the way it was. And also, like, I really believe that this was the journey that I decided to take to get me to this point now. You know, mum, you're probably watching. I love you. Don't feel bad. <laughs> um, but so that was my wound. That child cannot does not have the resources to to heal that wound. So I moved through that developmental stage from zero to seven with that wound. And then what happened is I carried that pain through with me. That wound was painful for me. So when I got to teenage years, it was still within me. I still felt it. And as soon as I discovered alcohol and drugs, that took that pain away, right? Briefly, that soothed that, that pain for me. And then what happens, so when you get into the teenage years, is you try and hide and you try and protect that wound. And then what happens is defence mechanisms, what's called the defence mechanism, is put into place. And then the defence mechanisms, is like I said, protecting and hiding this wound. And mine were drinking, drug taking, and all of those things to keep that wound safe. So going back, so talking about that wound then, what we need to imagine is that's what all people, all therapists will decide, describe as the inner child. And the inner child lives within our subconscious mind. Now, when we talk about the mind, what we need to really understand is that the mind as a whole, we have this 5%. 5% of our brain is this conscious, conscious part of your mind the one that makes the decisions, the one that kind of runs the show. And everything else, the other 95% is basically um, programs, programs, subconscious programs. And what we need to know in that is that in that 95% of that subconscious mind, everything that you have ever done, okay, ever felt is just kept within that mind. And that little inner child is rattling around in that subconscious mind. And the subconscious mind is ridiculously clever, right? If something really painful happens to you, what it will do is it will literally put it in a box, open 12th of never, and just stick it in the subconscious mind. It will even like make you think, forget about it. Or you can think, oh, yeah, that happened, but it didn't really affect me. So that little inner child rattling around in your brain feeling sad, feeling insecure, feeling whatever she whatever she feels, what generally happens in life now is that she gets triggered, that inner child gets triggered and the defence mechanisms that are in place are basically covering this part of you which feels really, really incomplete and the self-soothing there makes us feel good, it takes that pain away. And alcohol is the one thing that kind of takes that, it takes that edge off it, it takes the edge off that pain. And then because it takes the edge off that pain, it begins to be, just turns into a habit. And that's an addiction, isn't it? A habit, something that you can't stop doing. And so we start drinking in our teens and when we feel bad, when we feel sad, when we feel rejected, even if we've had time off the alcohol we will boom go straight back to that because that's our friend that makes us feel better and so 10 years later 20 years later 30 years later 40 year, years later you can still be running that same old habit of all that drinking or drug taking or getting stoned or gambling or porn or whatever it is that kind of floats your boat and soothes yourself and that's why it's so so hard to stop and trying to stop drinking or any of these habits with willpower alone is it's impossible because you're trying to do it with 5% of your mind and you need to get back into that 95% of your mind which is your subconscious which is where the wounds actually are held. So you can't actually de destroy the defence which is the drinking which is the habit without first healing the wound. 
So again, like I was saying to you, for me as that therapist, I am working with deeply getting into that subconscious mind. As I said, a demon hunter, finding those blocks, finding those wounds and healing them. And we have like so many different modalities to just get in and be with that child again and make them feel safe, heal them. So ultimately, the subconscious mind just wants you to be at peace, right? So when you ask the subconscious mind for directly to take you to this place, take you to a situation, to a memory that needs to be healed, it will because it desperately wants you to, to sort your shit out because peace is our natural, most natural state of being. So like I said, I'm going to leave the little Bruce Lipton link at the end um, so that if this is something that you're interested in, I mean, and it's probably resonating with you guys, people who are big drinkers, it's probably like you're thinking, oh yeah, I know what my wound is, I know why, and it's making some sense to you. So yeah, if you want to watch the Bruce link, it will give you a little bit of extra insight into it, okay? So that's the psychology behind it, that's the science. And so what I decided to do was put together a four week intensive program. And we're gonna do it a little bit differently to what has gone before. So basically this is a unique opportunity. There's courses like Annie Grace is doing an amazing course called uh, The Alcohol Experiment. And, but hers is online. So what my idea was to do was to do a course where you get your four one-on-one -on -one sessions with me. Um, the one-on-one -on -one sessions are like an hour and a half and we really, really go in deep. We really go in deep and we demon hunt and we get to the core, we find those, those real wounds that I was talking about. And, you know, I'm sure that talking about this inner child, talking about this wound is resonating with loads of people, loads of you, you're really kind of understanding and checking into that. But, so we do that and that's one aspect of the course. But also I realized from many times of having periods of abstinence uh, from drinking, it's not very much fun, okay? You feel very, very isolated because you know, your friends, your your group are doing completely different things. You don't want to go to the pub because you don't want to drink. You don't want to go to a club. Fucking boring being around people who are like pissed out of their heads when you're the sober one. So, I mean, actually the world is changing and these days things are different. There's a massive shift happening and people are like, they're, they're looking after their bodies. They're looking after their minds. They're becoming like better people, more evolved people than what it was several years ago. Um, but with that being said, with this course, the second aspect of what I wanted to do was create, to go alongside all that deep healing, was to create a, a lovely support group for us all. And just running that so that you don't feel like you're missing out. You've got somewhere to go and we're going to have six sessions over those four weeks where we come together and we'll run it together like I do a lot of ceremonies now and the whole point of ceremony to me is getting into it and creating a beautiful space where you can take your mask off and where you can be completely open and completely honest with people. So that's what I wanted to do, create this support group because honestly if you look out there and you try and get support when you're giving up alcohol... There's AA, which is a fantastic institution, but it's a little bit outdated, you know. My approach is to have, like, fun, light sessions where we can be brutally, brutally honest about what's going on and how we're feeling. And also incorporating a whole of different things, like doing energy clearings, doing breath work, um, having mocktail evenings do meditations, I even wanted to squeeze in a cheeky little bit of cold water swimming, that might make some of you go, ah, but just because it's just so amazing, it's such a great way to get back into your spirit of adventure, and yeah, just really trying to get that sharing, that connecting, and that support, which is what we need, and you know what, I'm obviously during that month we are going to, or I'm going to ask you to commit and have one month 
of not drinking, and I'm not saying that you have to give up drinking forever, but just seeing what it would be like to be sober and working with those wounds as well, those deep wounds, because as soon as you've healed those deep wounds, everything changes and everything shifts for you. For like me now, that I've done all of that deep work, I can go out and have a drink. I don't choose to go out and have a drink very often, but now I weigh up. I mean, like in the old days, if I had a day of not drinking, that would be a huge thing for me. Something that I was like, okay, I'm not gonna drink today, and it would be a real big challenge. Whereas now it's completely opposite. If I'm gonna go and have a drink, and I don't have many, I don't get fucked up, I just have a few, I, um, I weigh up the pros and cons. Do I have that energy? Do I have that time and that, that, that energy to spend the next day being hungover? Is it gonna be worth it? Because let's really think about how much time, money and energy do we spend on alcohol, <laughs> right? When I stopped drinking, I was minted, you know? I'd like, I'd pretty much, I couldn't afford food, but you always find money for fags, you always find money for a bottle of wine or for a pint, you know? It's just changing that, that you know, flipping that switch in our heads, changing our, our mindset to it all. So this course that I'm gonna put forward, the actual cost all in all is gonna be 400 pounds and you're gonna get four one-on-one -on -one sessions with me. Now, that would normally cost 70 pounds per session anyway, so that was 280 pounds um, value and then another 120 pounds for those six sessions that we're gonna have as the amazing community thing. I will also set up um, a Facebook group. I'm gonna buddy you up with a friend so you've always got someone in your time of need to, you know, to get that support from. 400 quid might sound like a lot of money, but think about how much money you spend on alcohol per week. You know, the way that I always used to sum it up to myself after I stopped doing drugs and alcohol, it's like 50 quid, ah, it's only like, it's only a gram of Coke. I think Coke's more expensive these days. But you know, you know, 400 quid is an actual investment into your future. And it, to like seeing the beauty in the world, because I tell you, when I was a big drinker, I saw nothing in this world apart from denseness and negativity. Sometimes I had, if I was drunk, I had a good time for a very, very small window. But I was just, yeah, I was just running through life completely unconscious and the things that I've been able to create to enjoy to love since I've just nailed this habit is absolutely amazing um so if any of that resonates with you <laughs> I'm hoping that what I will do is run the course in March um I'm going to leave links below uh firstly the Bruce the Bruce Lipton thing um and also of contact details for me so just send me a little email and obviously as well as running the program, I just do one-on-one um, -on -one coaching. So yeah, just hit me up and send me a little email and that'd be great. So with all of that being said, as promised, I, I'm just gonna do a little energy clearing meditation with you guys now. So it's gonna go on a lovely little journey to a magical tree where we will just be able to just release and let go of some negative emotions some dense energy that we don't no longer need. So again, I'm just gonna invite you to get yourselves nice and comfy, lie down, sit down, whatever it is that you wanna do, and just close your eyes. So if you're in a comfortable space with your eyes closed, I invite you again to just begin to tune into your breath. Big, deep, long breaths. It's completely at your own pace. Just imagine breathing in that love, that light, and letting go of anything that doesn't serve you. And I want you just to imagine that above your head, 30 feet up in the air, a golden light appears. And from this golden light, a golden shower begins to pour out and you just command that your crown chakra opens and you allow this golden light to come down into your head, allowing it to swirl around your brain, down into your cheeks, 
your chin, your neck, and it goes down into your shoulders and it relieves all that tension down, cascading down your arms and into your fingertips. And it works its way down your spine, vertebrae by vertebrae, down your torso, into your pelvis, down your legs, your knees, your calves, and into your feet. And as it does, it just relaxes you down, down, down. And you feel yourself feeling very peaceful, very calm. And you find yourself now standing at the top of a very magnificent staircase. And this staircase has five steps. And I invite you to allow me to count you down these steps. And with each step, you will feel more and more relaxed. So here we go. Five, drifting down now. Four, sinking deeper down now. Three, just letting yourself go. Two, completely surrendering and one going even deeper now and as you place your feet down off the last step you move your toes around and you feel very very soft sand underneath them and you look out and you feel as though you're in a very, very magical place. Out to sea you look and you notice that the sun is just beginning to bob above the horizon. And you feel the world beginning to wake up. You hear the sounds of nature, the birds singing good morning to each other and you smell that fresh salty air. There's a beautiful wind, a warm balmy wind that wraps around your body. And even though this may never, you may never have been to this place before, you feel completely relaxed and completely at ease. And you turn to your left side and you notice that there's fire that has been left for you and it's smouldering away and you smell the smoke and you're drawn towards the warmth of this fire. You walk towards it and with every single step you feel more and more relaxed. As you get closer to the fire, you notice that it's illuminating a very, very big tree. And this tree is so old and so wise and you notice that on every single branch of this tree is pinned pieces of paper. And these pieces of paper are A4 in size. Some are dark and some are very light and bright. And I'm gonna invite you now to walk over to one of those very dark pieces of paper and put your hand down and pull one of the pieces of paper down that you feel drawn to. As you pull it down, you hold it towards your heart. Feel into this feeling. What is this negative emotion that this piece of paper holds for you? And as you feel into it, feel where it resonates within your body. And when you're ready, I want you to take this piece of paper and just begin to fold it and fold and fold and fold and fold and keep folding until that piece of paper is so small and so significant, insignificant. And when you're ready, I want you to take the piece of paper and throw it onto the fire. Whoosh. Watching it burn, knowing now that you have let go of some dense, 
negative emotion that's stored within your field. And feeling just a little bit lighter now, you go back to the tree and you pull down another grey, dark piece of paper and again you hold it close to your heart. What does this piece of paper mean to you? And just do that body scan and see where that, where that emotion, that, that dense negative energy is being held within your body. And when you've located it, just begin to fold and fold and fold and fold that piece of paper until it's so small and so insignificant. And when you're ready, throw it into that fire and whoosh watching it burn and now for the last time I want you to just go back now to the tree and pull down another piece of paper just hold it really close hold it close to your heart what does this piece of paper represent for you feeling into it, feeling into this energy, this emotion, something that's been in your field that is no longer serving you. And then begin once more to fold it. And you fold, and you fold, and you fold, and you keep folding until it's so small and so insignificant. And when you're ready, just letting it go. Letting it go, knowing that you have let go of that dense, dark energy within your field. And feeling much lighter now, you're drawn to the bright, beautiful, positive pieces of paper. And I want you to walk to the brightest, brightest piece of paper, and I want you to pull it down from the tree. And again, hold it into your heart what is this beautiful, positive, elevated emotion which you feel? Feel into that and just allow that colour, that emotion, that energy to be absorbed into your body. And just let that beautiful colour and emotion swirl around your heart, into your shoulders, down into your arms, into your fingertips down your torso, down your spine, down into your legs, into your feet. And again, back up into your neck, swirling around your brain and your head until you feel this positive energy, this bright, beautiful feeling in every single 60 trillion cells within your body. And you allow those cells just to start to dance starting to dance and move around and as you do so your body begins to dance and move and you connect to that wild man or wild woman within yourself your true authentic self and you begin to dance around that fire om tare tu tare tu tare soha om tare tu tare tu tare soha om tare tu tare tu tare soha Om tare tu tare tu tare soha. And as you just come to stillness now, you take a deep breath and you feel so much better, so much lighter. And you thank the tree for its wisdom and you thank the fire for its courage to burn through all of that negative energy. And I ask you now, I invite you just to take some big, deep breaths, feeling into that part of yourself, your authentic self. And I just ask you now just to call back all your energy, all your magic, all your power and all your love. And so it is. And so it is. And so it is. And when you're ready, you can just open your eyes back with me here. So I hope you enjoyed that and I just want to thank Whiskers firstly for allowing me and asking me to do this presentation 
and to thank all of you, everyone who's watched this, especially if you've watched it to the end, thank you for your precious time. And again, if any of this resonates with you, there's links below of how to get in touch with me. I am at Nuki Therapy Centre and yeah, just reach out. Thank you.